some the praise Lord. tonight. Amen. 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 God, you are so good. We don't deserve you, Lord. We don't deserve our salvation. We don't deserve your love. But we receive it. Amen. 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 I receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm unworthy. I'm undeserving, but I receive it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, for loving us, look, Lord, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter what we're going through, Lord. Your love never fades. Your love never fails. And your faithfulness is forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. You know, our God is a God of miracles. There's nothing that he can't do. I don't know what kind of circumstance you might be facing tonight. You might be fighting with your woman. I pray that you're not fighting with your man. I'm sorry, I learned that from Rudy. <laughs> but we all have our struggles, amen? You might be fighting with a loved one, a brother, sister, mother, whatever. Our God is a God of reconciliation. Our God is a God who restores. He fixes things that we break, amen? As we sing this song, let's remember nothing is impossible for our God. A Saturday was silent, a surely it was through. Since when is impossible ever stopped you? A Friday's disappointment. A Sunday's empty tomb Since when is impossible Ever stopped you This is the sound of dry bones rattling This is the praise Make a dead man walk again Open the grave I'm coming out I'm Gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave, sound the dry bone rattling. A Pentecostal fire is stirring something new. You're not.
slaves to addiction no more. We don't want to be slaves to pornography anymore. We don't want to be slaves to alcohol anymore or any other kind of drug or nicotine, any of that stuff. We don't want to be slaves. We want to be set free tonight. Amen. I want to be set free tonight. Unravel us tonight, Lord God. Undo all the stupid things that we've done. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. Thank you, Lord, of deliverance from my enemy. Till all my fears are gone. Come on, sing that again, Braylon. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my
you mean it. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Oh, I am a child of God. Jesus, lover of my soul. him until the very end. Amen. Though my world may fall, I will never let you go. 
You know, you think about Job, the punishment and all the suffering that he did, everything was stripped away from him. And not only was everything taken away from him, he was got sick and had sores all over his body to top it all off. He never lost his faith. Even when his wife was telling him to, he never gave up and he never stopped believing in God. Amen. Amen. When we sing songs like this, I, I pray that we're not just saying these words just to say them because we're up here singing them. But we sing them from our heart and we really telling God that no matter what happens, Lord, no matter what comes my way, I'm going to keep on serving you till my dying day. Amen. If we could have our ushers come forward as we continue to worship in our giving this evening. But I want you to think of some of those circumstances where God has already brought you from, brought you through. Amen. I'm that guy's. All my friends, that, that guy ain't never going to change. But when I came out of a prison, a new man, I changed everybody's mind. Amen. Amen. By the glory of God, working in my life and me surrendering to him. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Amen. I know there's a lot of testimonies in this room right here. A lot of testimonies of changed lives by surrendering to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Fathers, we humbly come before you tonight, Father God, as we continue to worship um, with our our finances, Lord God, that uh, that you would just multiply them as, as we sow these seeds, Father God, that they would multiply at this this church, Lord God, and you would do what you want to do, do what you need to do, and help us to be obedient to you in all things, Father God. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's have some joy in the house of the Lord. Amen. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy.
You know, who you, who you hang out with often will literally determine who you are. If, if, if you hang around with some, some specific people, <laughs> pretty soon everybody, you might not be that type of person, but everybody will identify you as such. Yeah, because they, they base it on who you're hanging around with that way. It's always been like that. People will perceive and they'll, they'll, they'll determine that that way. Let me show this. You know, throughout, throughout, for thousands of years, people have, have, have decided to serve the Lord in many different ways, how they perceive the right way and how they walk with God, their relationship with the Lord. They've, they've chosen how they're going to honor God, how they're going to serve the Lord in, 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 in different ways. Like even recently when I was a child, I remember in church, in all holding the church, in Pentecost, all holding the churches, I remember through the congregations, some families, if, I said it before, if you had a TV, you were the devil. Yeah, they did. If you had a TV, man, you were the devil. They would say in Spanish, te reprendo en el nombre de Cristo. They were saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. That's, I remember hearing that. Yeah, they were, they were like, and if you had a tattoo, you're, you're going straight to hell. Yeah, if you had a tattoo, you were going to hell, brother. And they would tell you. Yeah, people, people were the way they were, the way they were. Even a few hundred years ago, Catholicism, the Pope, um, acknowledged and they banned uh, coffee. They called it the bitter, and I'm quoting what the book said, the bitter, the bitter invention of Satan. Coffee was of the devil back in the days. If you drank coffee, boy, you were from the devil. Some of you guys are from the devil drink. <laughs> Some of you guys saw the devil about five times a day, huh? <laughs> cup after cup. Yeah. And times change. Times change on how to reach people, how to deliver the word. But the word is still the same. But, 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 but the way people are, it, it, it's changed. Now, I'm not here to say, you know, everything I just said right now is good or bad. or that. I'm not here to do that today. But Because otherwise, we'd have a list of a thousand things that we shouldn't be doing. Or a thousand things that, we should, that we're doing wrong. But then just the same, there might be a list of a thousand things, the things that we're doing right or, things the, way we, or the things we need to do. But I'm not here for that today. Hebrews 13, 8 says this. The Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he, who he is and what he expects of the people of God, that hasn't changed. Just because society and people change, God's not saying, okay, because now you're exposed to a bigger mess, and it's 2024, social media is there. You can go ahead and sin a little bit. It's cool. <laughs> That's not happening. The Lord has not changed. He's the same. There's still only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus. There is no other way. There's only one way. And the church has, 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 has pulled away from, I'm not talking about the brick and mortar, but the people, the church has pulled away from holiness. They're afraid to speak holiness and to live for God, to do your best to live holy. And, and, and to speak that. They're afraid of that. They're afraid of offending people. They're afraid of getting people mad. People leaving the church, leaving the body, not paying their offering, their tithes. That way. But you know, this day and age, in serving the Lord, I believe that during Jesus' time was here, when he was here and after he resurrected, I believe that was one of the, one of the worst times because the persecution that they went through, the, the, the beginnings, the inception of the church. They went through some crazy persecution you know, being killed and persecuted and imprisoned and stoned and burned alive. And they, were, they went through some crazy persecution. So for us to be able to say, oh, I'm under persecution, you're lying. I mean, I can say I get spiritually attacked, but I haven't been under no persecution. So for somebody to say, oh, I'm under, I, we have not felt that in the United States. Yeah, somebody hid my Bible. But we have not witness that, you know, that way, but, it, but still, 
the mess that you and I, the, this, that we as men are exposed to, your family to, that what we're exposed to, I kind of see it like a, a gauntlet or like a big tunnel, a gauntlet that we as people of God have to keep moving through this mess on both sides. And we're being attacked, you know, spiritually and with all these temptations and trials and distractions from both sides. And in the midst of this, this, this gauntlet that we're having to go through, the Lord says, I still need you to stop in the middle of it. And I need you to look to the right. I need you to minister. I need you to touch. I need you to, I need you to begin, begin to move. And in the middle of, this, of middle of this gauntlet of all this mess, God says, I don't need you outside that gauntlet. I need you inside of it to be able to reach those that I'm calling you to reach. And in that gauntlet, there's a lot of mess going on. But many times we're so consumed with what we're going through, we want to run right through it and we just ignore everybody and everything and, and we don't get nothing done for the kingdom of God because we're so consumed with us, with me. And with what I'm going through with my family, my wife, my kids, my finances, my health, we get so consumed with that that we... We lose focus because all we see is the mess on the right and the left, and we find it difficult to be able to minister to somebody in the most difficult time. So I want to see how, how Paul did it. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, because you, you heard me talk about Paul. Paul was an awesome man of God, a Christian killer, prosecutor that way, and came against all that had to do with the things of Jesus and became a fanatic. You know, on the road to Damascus, we had an encounter with, with Jesus. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone. Don't belong to nobody. Nobody owns him, but he made himself, he makes himself a slave to everyone. In other words, going out of his way always for the sake of somebody else, to do something for somebody else. Paul is saying, if I place myself, to paraphrasing, at that bar backyard barbecue gathering, if I decide to go to the game with those heathen folks, if I deliberately place myself there, it's because I have a purpose. I have a reason why I am doing this. I'll read it again. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. So he had a purpose to win as many as possible. So I'm not going to ask you like I've done before, how many did you win today? How many did you win this week? How many did you win this month? How many did you win this year? That tells me you're going through the gauntlet, but you're running right through this thing. You're avoiding all the mess that people are going through all around you, and we're not stopping according to what the Lord wants us to do and say, you know what, I'm going to stop right here. I'm telling you right now, if you're real busy doing everything else, you need to back up and think twice and think three times because God's on the move right now. We're in harvest time. And God's using men. He's using men in a supernatural way. And I'm telling you, we need to get ready. Don't get so consumed with your issues that you can't see what God wants for us, that which in turn is for somebody else. So verse 20 is what Paul does. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. But remember, Paul wasn't a Jew. He was a Roman. So what Paul did, he limits his own rights and freedoms in order to connect with other Jews. He limits what he does in order to connect with those that need Jesus. Watch the second half of, two, of 20. For those under the law, I, be, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. In other words, those are the Gentiles. He was saying, I became like the Jews that are under the law, 
the Gentiles that are not, that I may win some people to Christ. I made some adjustments in my life. I did what I had to do to win those to the Lord. Verse 22, stay with me. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. By all possible means. It does not mean by he said by all possible means that you're going to sacrifice your salvation for somebody else's sake. That's not what it's saying. He is not saying for you to say, well, I'm going to go kick it with him and walk into the bar and drink with him so that when I tell him the gospel, he won't feel threatened by it. That's not what by all possible means stands for. Because we want to get real, we want to be real quick to say, oh, yeah, but... but." It's, that's not what it's talking about. But by all possible means, I can say different delivery systems reaching people in certain ways, by all possible means to win some. Mm. So what the Lord has said thousands of years ago, in reality, is it still the exact same today? It's the same. It is. But in the context of any writings that we might have now, it's not talking about, uh, like back in the days, it was talking about camels and sheep and goats and sacrifices and, and all that stuff. You don't, we're not. How many of you have a camel at home? <laughs> how many of you have a chariot? Or That's what I'm saying. It, it, but, the, but the Lord is, is, is exactly the same. He's, he's, his, his, his heart for us is the same. What he expects from us is the same. Reaching the people is the same. He's still in love with the backslider. Look at this, Joshua 24, 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, in other words, he's saying, you don't have to serve the Lord. But if it's undesirable to you, he's saying, make a decision. He says, if, if serving the Lord is undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Choose. Like I've said, so many people want the blessings of God, but they don't want to bless God. They want, they want God's hand upon them, but they don't want to put the hand to the, to the ministry, to the plow. And we want to put the hand on the plow and, and move forward. We all want to keep looking back. Yeah. We want God's blessing, but we don't want to bless God because we're too busy. We're too preoccupied. I'm older. I'm tired now. I don't see that in, in Bible, brothers. Yeah. I'm old and I'm tired, but you ain't got no problem hitting that booty, though, and you're old and tired. Yeah. Translate that, brother. I don't know how he's going to say that in Spanish, but praise the Lord, brother. <laughs> I see a Hispanic brother just smiling right there. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> they better behave, amen. Once again, I read it again. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, I said, but for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Yeah. If we confess with our tongue that we are serving God, what does that mean? What does it curtail? What's that really? What's that? I'm serving the Lord, okay? I'm a Christian, okay? I think everybody calls themselves Christian. 
Yeah. They know a scripture verse. I'm a Christian. Yeah. Let's look at the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 5. And I'm going to read 21 to 24. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Verse 23. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. So once, once, once again, the scripture walked with God. Like it says in Genesis where, where Adam walked with God. The way I see that right now, when you walk with God, is in the manner of how I live my life right now. How I conduct myself in everything that I do and that I honor God first in every deed that I do. In other words, my walk with God needs to be evident in who I am and to those around me in my walk with God. That no one can say, ah. because of the walk that people see in who you are. Are you with me? See, Enoch, as he lived, he, he learned how to please God. And the Lord said that. He, God was pleased with him in the midst of a wicked society. Uh, he was an ordinary man. He had the same problems and burdens that we all have. He had a wife. Amen. He had children. I'm sure he had, you know, he had to get food. He had, to, you know, he, he had, he had, he had burdens he had to carry. Uh, the Bible doesn't say that he was um, a hermit, you know, hidden away in the wilderness cave to live holy before God. It doesn't say that. You know, he was involved in life just like the rest of us, but yet he pleased God. Hmm. So when I hear that Enoch pleased God, I want to know how he lived. I want to know what Enoch did that God said, I'm pleased with him. But if I look at history, religion really wasn't there yet. Churches weren't there yet. It wasn't there. Look at Genesis 5, 24. Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. So now let's go back. Let's go read Hebrews eleven five. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. So Hebrews 11.5 tells us very clearly that before this translation, before he was taken up, however he was taken, however God took him, his testimony to him I mean, to his family and to the people that knew him, because that's what a testimony is. His testimony, when people spoke of him, is that Enoch pleased God, you guys. Enoch pleased God. And it was evident. The Bible says that was his testimony. So what was it that Enoch did that pleased God? Now, these two verses... Um, that I'm going to give you right now, Hebrews 11.5 that I just read, and I'm going to give you 11.6. Hebrews, they cannot be separated. Let me tell you why. I'm going to read Hebrews 11.5 again. Clearly says that before his, Enoch's trans, uh, translation, before he was taken up, once again, his testimony was that he, he pleased God. So look at Hebrews 11.6. So you know he pleased God. So here it is, 11.6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. The verse right after that. Without faith. In other words, could have been doing everything else, but don't have the faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So when describing Enoch being taken away, the very next thing is said is that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists 
and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So many times when we talk about faith, we, we talk about faith as trusting in God and your finances, have faith to lay hands on the sick, you will recover, all these kind of things. The Bible's not describing it like that there. He's saying, having faith that he exists. Yeah. Having faith that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Having faith, believing that will please God. Believing that he exists and that he's going to reward you if you earnestly seek him. He's saying, that is what pleases me. If we would walk with God on a daily basis and be communing, communing with him, be people of faith, just imagine that. Having that type of faith and relationship first. And then watch what God does. Believing that. You know, we say, well, I believe that. Then how come you don't talk to him? Yeah, how come, how come we, don't, we don't talk to him like that? How come, how come, we, don't do, how come we don't do that? Well, I'm busy again. I don't got time for that. I'm real tired still. I'm old, I'm old remember? <laughs> Enoch's walk with God was not based on church attendance or ministry involvement. It wasn't. It wasn't. I'll show you in a minute. It was not based on fellow brothers and sisters of the Lord. It wasn't based on that. It was not based on leaders or even pastors. Enoch had no Bible. He didn't have a Bible. Enoch had no Bible, no context of Scripture yet, nothing. He didn't have anything. He didn't have the scrolls even yet. Elijah and Elijah weren't there yet. Moses wasn't there yet. They had nothing. He had, Enoch had nothing. Enoch was one of the first ones. And once again, it was not based on a written word. It was not based on pastors or leaders or ministry. It was not based on people. It was not based on the rent veil, giving everybody access to the holy of holies. It was not based on that either. Stay with me. But the scripture says that he pleased God. Hmm. It wasn't based on the obedience of the word. It wasn't based by paying my tithes. It wasn't based on the faith on, on helping the poor. Or maybe, I don't know, but it wasn't based on, 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 any of those, on any of those things. But yet, he pleased God. And when the Lord gave me this message, I questioned why this message in reality to the lives of men, to the lives of families which these men influence. And the Lord gave me a, a revelation. And um, the Lord spoke to my spirit. He said that, um, I wrote it down here, that many that are in relationships, he said it like this, in marriage, that are in turmoil. And they're in turmoil because the relationship of one individual uh, has with the Lord is based, um, let me say like this, the one, there's an individual within, within a marriage that, that loves God or is in ministry. And the other spouse, whether it's the man or the, or, the, or, the, or the woman, is basing their walk with God on the spouse's fellowship with God. That, oh yeah, I'm involved in ministry because my wife is, 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 is uh, or, 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 or I, the wife, I'm involved in ministry because my husband is doing that over there. And the Lord said something to me, a second thing real quick. He said, he said, their eyes are upon me, but through the reflection of somebody else's eyes. They see me, but through the reflection of somebody else's eyes. Because their walk is an independent with God. 
that we're relying upon somebody else, that we're close to a spouse or a, blood, a, a child, a, 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 a children, and we don't have that personal, in other words, our eyes are fixed with, on God and we see him, but we see them through the reflection of somebody else's eyes. I said, dang. That many of our relationships are based on those that we love. Because if our family members may be serving God, then I'm going to do it too. And I'm going to do it because I want them to do good. That's all great, but you're not going, you're not going to heaven on their coattail. You have to know... You and me more than anything, the male, the man. We have to know that more than anybody else. I don't, regardless of what, what anybody else is doing, amen? Regardless of what anybody else is doing, we, we need to know where we do and we do not stand. That our calling is based sometimes many, on the spouse. And we cannot do that. Hmm. That's why many times when, when one of the spouse decides to either leave the church or get away from ministry, the other one pulls back too. And they pull back too because we were fixed on Christ through their eyes and not yours. See, and I wrote this down, when you have a personal relationship with Jesus, with Christ, it does not matter what your wife does or does not do in Christ. In or out of Christ, it doesn't matter. If you've got a personal relationship with the Lord, it doesn't matter what your spouse does or does not do. If your wife is dictating your salvation and you walk with Christ, I don't know how else to say it, but I'll say it like this, you're a spiritual punk. Yeah. 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 Don't let that ever happen. Never. Once again, if you have a personal relationship with Christ, it does not matter what your children do. If they choose not to serve God, you, well, you're going to pray, you're going to fast for them. If they choose to serve God, praise the Lord. You, the Lord might call your children and your spouse in a way he has not called you. Pearl helps out. Pearl, she, does, she helps out in everything in my ministry. She does it. She, busts her, she does everything in my ministry, but she has her own too. She does. She has her own ministry. You men, I'm telling you right now, you men of God, you men that say you love Jesus, you better look at your females. You better talk with your females and you better find out where God has called them because maybe you and I are the biggest hindrance in their life and they have not stepped up what God has called them to do because they're afraid of you or what you're going to say or you're not going to back them up. You're not going to support them. And they're saying, I'm just waiting on my husband. You need to sit down with the women in your life. I don't care if it's your wife, it's your mom, your grandmother, your daughters, your granddaughters, your, your daughter-in-laws. You need to sit down and talk with them and say, what is the Lord telling you? How can I help you? How can I serve you? Let the words come from your mouth, not from the pastor's mouth. Let God move through your words, not somebody else's words. Speak that life. Allow them to have a relationship with God and the Lord call them into ministry. It might be the most basic thing. Well, I just want to help. I just want to make curtains for the church. Praise the Lord. That's kingdom work, making curtains for the church. Amen. I just want to come in. I want to vacuum. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're so afraid. Well, if, 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 if my wife's in church, then who's going to make breakfast, lunch, and dinner for me? Because I guarantee if your wife falls in line with, in line with God, there's times you ain't getting no dinner. I'm telling you right now, you can't be like, Ugh. if your wife falls in love with God, there's going to be some time that she says, I'm paying extra tithes. What do you mean? You're going to have to be in a position to say, okay, okay, I, I, I got this. Yeah, you're going to have to. You can't be a hindrance. <laughs> When you have, and I wrote this down here, when you have a personal relationship with Christ, there's going to be a whole different perspective and reality and acceptance of the calling of those you love. I'll explain it like this. Because many times when the Lord moves in a person's life, and all of a sudden, if it's you and you're doing ministry where you're, you're busy for the kingdom, doing church, wherever you're at, doing kingdom work, 
Sometimes the spouse or the children will say, You're, God is taking you from us. You're always doing ministry. You're always helping out people. You're always in the church. You're always doing stuff. Let me say, gentlemen, I have some, some ladies right now that were kicking and bucking because their husband would not go to church and serving the devil, drinking and buying cocaine and spending all their money. They were just doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And now that the husband been for the last few years in love with God, serving the Lord, Holy Ghost filled, speaking in tongues, doing ministry, and now she comes back to me and says, I'm sick and tired because he's never at home. He's always with you guys at the church. He's always busy doing this stuff. And, and we stop and he's helping somebody. And I don't know what to say. I want this. Don't make me get a case right now. Kicking and bucking because the husband is doing kingdom work. But yet she was crying when he was out there with a the dope. But now serving God, <laughs> yeah, I don't get it. So many times they don't understand. But when an individual has a relationship and falls in love with God, they have an encounter with the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon them. They see the evidence of the life being changed with the spouse or the kids or it's the wife with you, and they begin to see God doing something in you. And then they're like, ooh, I'm going to nurture that. You begin to have an appreciation for what God is doing in the life of somebody else within your life. It, it, it'll, it'll hinder you a little bit because you ain't going to get the dinners all the time and maybe your clothes ain't going to be washed all the time or whatever. But if you have a relationship with God, you're going to say, that's okay right there. That's okay right there. But when you don't have that relationship, it has become a hit. Kingdom work becomes a hindrance. It becomes a burden within your family. Kingdom work become, becomes a problem in your family, um, in your household, because we don't have an understanding of who Christ is within us. So once again, if you start kicking and bucking, because you ain't getting them tortillas, you need to, you need to, you need to start thinking, okay, hold up, hold up, God. Then I, I, don't, don't, don't get on your wife or your kid. You need to, you need to talk to you. You need, you need to deal with what God is doing inside of you. Amen? Amen. Once again, when you have a relationship with Christ, you, you begin to see and understand and appreciate those talents God has given people. Like, I'll tell you, I'll tell you right now. Pearl didn't know I'm saying this, but I'll tell you right now. Um, she says, she goes, can I talk? I said, yeah, tell me month or so ago, I really have in my heart, and I, I think I told a couple of brothers, she goes, I have in my heart, I want to go out into the streets and start doing, um, I like the sidewalk Sunday schools, I want to go back into the neighborhoods, and I want to, you know, like, adopt a complete apartment complex, and I want to bring stages out there, and I want to bring people, I want to bring games out there, and I want to, I want to, I want to have services for all the kids, and I want to minister to their family members, she give me a whole list of stuff, and the first thing I'm thinking, I'm like, like, hey, my mind starts, okay, let's see. Um, we, I never have Fridays off. I'm doing something. If we have Saturdays off and we're going to be doing ministry, I'm starting to think. And the Holy Ghost says, what are you doing? What are you saying? What are you thinking? So before I say anything else, I said, that'd be awesome. I said, you know what I'll do? I told her, I'll get a truck. I'll get a truck that has a built-in stage in the back. I said, we'll pull that stage out, a portable stage. We'll have some speakers mounted on that sucker. And we'll have an outreach stage to begin to minister to kids. I said, we'll get some canopies. We'll do this and that. And she all of a sudden, okay, you know what we can do? When the spirit, when you have a relationship with God, you have a greater understanding of what God's doing in the life of somebody else. Instead of pulling back and saying, we can't do that. You don't have time to do that. Just because if you're doing good to God, you need to minister to your females. You need to talk to them. You need to talk to your wife. If you don't have a wife, you know, talk to somebody. <laughs> I'm serious. Talk to your sons. The reason, you know, I'll tell you like this. I, I'll tell you before. 
The reason we had that big old, uh, I, 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 just, I think I shared this a year ago, the reason we had that big old uh, shower trailer out there is because I told you my son came to me before I even thought of him. The Lord hadn't given it to me yet. My son Rudy, my oldest son, came to me, and he's successful. And he says, you know what, Dad, I want to buy, I want to buy, you a, I want to buy the church a big um, a showers trailer for the homeless to be able to, uh, uh, to, to help the homeless. They can take it wherever they want. It'll be self-contained. I want to buy a trailer, and you guys can take it to all the homeless. And as soon as he said that, I felt it inside of me. And I started calling people and brothers, and bro- Brother Justin Smith, one of the brothers that comes here, he started making phone calls, and he told about somebody else. Next thing you know, we got, one that do- we, got one- we got that one donated. You see, but what I'm saying, somebody just planted a seed. And I said, okay, you never bought it. You never bought it. He planted that seed. So what I'm saying, imagine the seed that you, the male, can impart unto your wife or to your kids, to your, your females. And I say the females because they're your females. You know, you're held accountable for them. You are. You're held accountable. You could have a matriarch or patriarch. You can have a man or woman that's, I don't, I don't mean above you, but that's, uh, that everybody listens to. But if you're the man, the man of God, God's going to hold you accountable for that bloodline. For your nephews and nieces. He's going to hold you. If that dad ain't right, he's going to hold you accountable. Those females, the daughter-in-laws, he's going to hold you accountable. You need to, you need to minister to them. Stay with me. Almost done. I'll show you why I'm saying this. Almost done. So when I'm serving the Lord, how? How? Once again, people get discouraged um, because their eyes are upon somebody else. And once again, they see the reflection of who Christ is, but through somebody else's eyes. And in reality, they haven't fulfilled the calling that God has placed upon their life. So the same spirit that spoke to Enoch is the same spirit that spoke to Paul. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live the life worthy of the calling you have received. Not saying your wife. Not saying your kids. The calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Some of us aren't kind. We're not kind. We're not humble in the house. And I'm saying we're not, we're not patient. Bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. When Enoch, through faith, was pleasing to God, listen, as I said, there wasn't temples. There wasn't churches. The high priest did not exist yet. There wasn't seminary. There wasn't, there wasn't evangelism training yet. They didn't have the Ten Commandments. The Mosaic laws were not in place yet. And Genesis 4.26 says this. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. So in reality, if you look at Enoch's life, how he was pleasing to God, the ministry wasn't there yet. The church wasn't there yet. The colleges, the Bible, the scrolls, the prophets weren't there yet like that. The first ministry that Enoch had that pleased God was his family. The first ministry that Enoch had, it wasn't the church. It was his family. It was his wife and his children. That's why it says to be humble, to be kind, to be patient. We need to be long-suffering. So we need to develop our personal relationship, first of all, with our first family. If you're going through a difficult time with your spouse or you're still obligated to your, your daughters and your sons and your grandchildren, if your spouse is not going to hear you out right now, if you're going through it with them, you're still obligated to all the rest of the females. And I specifically, the Lord puts in my heart the females, the, the men too, but in reality, the Lord is dealing with, with the sons on their own. He's 
that dealing with the females like that, the females have to fall under that covering. They do. And if your son has a wife and, and your son isn't in love with God, that covering falls on you. You need to step up and minister to, to your, your daughter-in-law. You need to minister to the females that God has placed before you. So develop your personal relationship with Christ through obedience to the word. So we have the word now. Be in prayer. And once again, I quote that scripture again, and begin to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And that calling is your family. It's your family. Yeah. Yeah. So be very careful with the word you have heard today. Be very careful. Because I see it, I haven't said, I don't see it so much as um, a carrot, I see it as a stick. If the Lord wanted to deliver this message with a stick, it's almost a rebuke that you need to listen and listen carefully. Because whether you think so or not, you are going to be held accountable. Yeah. And if you don't minister to your daughters, Satan will, because you already know and you choose not to do that, Satan will send a man. He will. He will send a man to intervene because you chose not to do it. But I don't know what to say. I'm not ready. I don't care if you're 100 years old, you're not going to be ready. What does ready mean? I memorized 10 scriptures. I went to church twice this week. What does ready mean? You know what? When God talks, the righteous will inherit the kingdom of God. Righteous is just those that act right. That's what it means. Those are making right decisions. Just those that know how to act right. I'll say it like this, act right. I'm done, let's all stand. 